Coming up on Engine Power, it's part two of the old school Ford 300 straight six. It's the total rebirth of a classic piece of history. John's back from the machine shop with the first Ford inline engine we've ever done. Now our goal is to see a power and torque improvement with off the shelf affordable parts. How was trip? It was all right. Other than I broke the bell housing Yeah, I was housing just about to say way. it didn't look too good. All yeah. Right. What I, happened there? I uh, dropped it going down the stairs. Really? Yeah, don't tell Tommy though. I'm just gonna tell him I found it that way. Glad it wasn't your toe. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll just clamp it down, but grind it out, know. yep, and then we'll run some tacks and do that cold method. I'll get Tommy to make sure I don't do nothing crazy wrong. Cool. That was a Chevy, it wouldn't have happened. Ford, Chevy, whatever. Today, we're using a list of off-the-shelf parts from Summit Racing for this build. Now, that includes a comp cam, an Offenhauser intake manifold, a set of Silvo light pistons, a Holley carburetor, several Felpro gaskets, an oil pan from Dorman, a DUI distributor, and a Headman header. Now, these parts will go on in just a few minutes, but first, we need to seriously address that so, crack. So what exactly happened here, Big John? I, uh, I might have dropped it down the stairs. <laughs> well, good thing is it's a nice clean break and the material we're working with since it just come from the machine shop is all good and clean. So all we have to do now is kind of grind it out and bevel it so we've got a place to weld. John will bevel the two pieces to be welded together. This will allow the weld to penetrate more than just the surface of the parts. What do you think there, Tommy? Not enough? Yeah, get right there in that curve. Tommy's done a lot of this type of welding. And after John's stair incident, he's eager to learn. There you go. Nice. The bell housing is the best thing to use as a fixture. <laughs> the broken piece of the block will locate itself with a dowel as well as two fasteners. John, have you ever done any stick welding to mount anything? Yeah, in high school at the 4-H. Well, man, whenever you're doing a repair like this on cast iron, you want to use nickel rod. Okay. Because there's kind of a technique you need to do because during the welding process, that cast starts to expand, and with a tap of a hammer, this nickel will compress, soak up all that expansion. Nice. Before you start sparking away, find a piece of scrap made out of the same material. This is a good way to get the welder setting right. Oh yeah, we're good right there. Get you warmed up and lessen the chance of further damaging the parts to be repaired. The tapping compresses the extra carbon that is naturally in flake form in cast iron. It helps to close the voids between them. Your turn. <laughs> now keep in mind, if too much heat is introduced and it cools rapidly, it. the metal hardens, making it extremely difficult to tap or drill. Nice. You know, as long as she holds together, that's all we need. Well, let her hold it till it breaks, that's for sure. Yeah. Thank serious. you, Tommy. I'm serious. That's what I love about building engines. The industry keeps cranking out new technology, and the aftermarket's right on their heels. But sometimes you get to learn an old skill from the past. We'll be back. The block is coming out of the washer for the final time after removing all that grinding debris. We're going to assemble this engine a little different, no engine stand. And that's because these engines are so long and nose heavy that they've been known to break off an engine stand. Okay. It's also a good idea because on a tight tolerance engine, they can bow so much that it can actually lock up a crank. Woo. So we're going to use this sturdy all steel table for the entire assembly. Sealed power cam bearings will be the first thing to go in. Now using the install tool, carefully position the bearing, notice the mark, so the oil passages line up with the oil galleys in the block. Next up are the oil galley plugs. Now if you miss one, you'll get a couple of warnings, an oily mess and or no oil pressure. Using a generous amount of Loctite gasket sealer, install the freeze plug so the leading edge of the lip is just behind the edge of the block. The rotating assembly can go in now. First, a set of sealed power main bearings can drop in the saddles. The thrust bearing on the 300 is the fifth main back. Now, lube them with Royal Purple assembly lube. Now, our cast steel crankshaft's got a pretty healthy stroke to it at 3.980, and it'll handle a lot more power than you think. Now, what it won't like is a lot of RPM. You get this thing above 5,000 and keep it there, and you will find out the limitations of this crankshaft. But not to worry, these things were designed to make it all down low. Gently drop the crank into place, then drop the caps on in order over the ARP main studs that will hold the bottom end together. 
and with plenty of lube, torque them to 70 foot-pounds. The factory rods measure in at 6.21 inches center to center. And remember, we resize them using new ARP rod bolts. Now the pistons are silvo lights from Summit Racing. They're a cast design that use a press fit pin and they're made to fit our 4060 bore. To mate the two together, Woo. stay away from a torch. The heat is not controllable and too much will weaken the rod. Spend the 30 bucks and have a local machine shop use a rod heater like our Goodson setup. Now we'll heat it till it starts to turn a light brown. With the pin slid into the piston, insert the rod and push the pin through making it evenly spaced on both sides. As the rod cools, the small end contracts making a press fit on the pin. Now the rings we chose are from Summit Racing and they've got a pretty cool story behind them. The 300 inline sixes were going to cost a little bit too much in my opinion. So what we did was just swap them over to a small block Chevy set in the same size we were able to save over 10 bucks. Now the 3 16 O-ring package at one time was almost industry standard between the big three. Now these two factory replacement compression rings are the same size at 564s. We're lubing the cylinder walls with automatic transmission fluid. This will allow the rings to seat and seal up a lot faster. For you guys that don't have micrometers, there is a go, no-go method when it comes to measuring bearing clearances. It's called plastic gauge and you can find it at your local auto parts store for about 35 cents. Ours is in the one to three thousandths range and we're looking for two to three in our rod bearing clearance. Cut about three quarters of an inch of the plastic gauge off. Now open the paper and pull out the gauge. Place it between the lubed rod bearing and the dry journal. Torque it to specs and remove. Now compare the gauge to the chart on the packaging. All right, we've got right at 2000s clearance. Now too much and oil pressure can be sacrificed. Too little and there's a good chance a damaged or spun bearing will introduce itself to you. Now we've got right what we wanted and we'll continue the assembly right after the break. We're back and we got all of our pistons in without any issues. Now I'm torquing the new ARP rod bolts that John installed to 45 foot-pounds and that's using ARP Ultra Torque Lube. With the rotating assembly torqued, we can spin it and make sure it rotates smoothly. And it does. So on to the camshaft. Our 300's flat tap it bump stick is an off-the-shelf grind from Comp Cams. Loctite 8028 camshaft lube will cover the lobes. Now it's used to protect the lobes from scuffing during break-in. This is a single pattern camshaft, which means gross valve lift for the intake and exhaust is the same at 456 thousandths. Now duration at 50 is 219 and the lobe separation angle is 110 degrees. The old timing gear material was nylon. Now it had to be removed to get the factory retainer plate off. This one is made of steel and will slip into place with the timing marks aligned. Nice. Now we can tighten the cam retainer plate to 15 foot-pounds. Using silicone to hold the unique looking timing chain cover gasket in place and loosely bolt on the original cover for now. Installing the balancer will center the seal on the balancer's hub and avoid premature seal failure. To move on, we need to reposition the block so the deck is upright. <laughs> We're using small blocks of wood to make it more stable on the table. Solid as a rock. Yeah. John spent some time getting the head ready for reassembly. Along with it, he also reworked the stock valves. Comp cam springs will complement the more aggressive camshaft, and they also sent retainers and locks to hold them in place. A Felpro gasket will make the seal between the head and the deck. The head is long and heavy. So an extra set of hands is a good way to get it on safe Whew. without damaging the gasket. The bolt holes are blind, so no sealing is needed. The ARP studs can go in with ultra torque lube. And a little more between the washer and the head. Following the factory torque sequence, we'll tighten the nuts with the Mako torque wrench to 85 foot-pounds. With the rocker studs installed, we can drop in the lubed hydraulic flat tappet lifters. Now they came from comp and were supplied with the cam as a kit. The push rods are next. Now John only removed a small amount of material from the head surface, so he's hoping a stock length push rod will still work. With a little die cam on the valve's tips, we can bolt on two rockers and rotate the engine. Now we're looking for a mark in the die cam that is narrow and in the center of the tip. Looks perfect. 
These comps have a 1-6 ratio and an aluminum body. They fit a 7 16 stud and they will be tightened to a half turn past zero lash using a Summit Racing lash adjusting wrench. At this point, the block is ready for some color. We'll use the original valve and lifter cover to keep paint out of the engine. To make sure the paint sticks, we'll spray the entire block with DupaColor's prep spray, which will remove all the oil and grease from the assembly process. Then as a base layer, a couple coats of engine primer. And with that dry, their ceramic engine paint can coat the block. It's gloss black and dyno proven to 500 degrees. Engines that are all one color are boring and don't make a good statement, but I'm going to change that by adding some style and attitude to the 300. And VHT's high temperature wrinkle plus coating is the perfect candidate to do that. Now they only offer it in black and red, but we need Ford blue. No worries, there's an easy way to get it. Over tightening causes the bolt hole area to crush toward the gasket. Now it also keeps the rail from sealing, so to avoid leaks, use a small hammer and dolly to flatten the area around the hole. After cleaning it, apply an even uniform coat of primer and let it dry. For this next step, you can use a heat gun like this or an oven. Now the goal is to warm the part up so it's warm to the touch. This will make the wrinkle plus stick really good to the primer and lessen the chance of a run. And here it goes. Once you have two to three good coats on, continue to heat the part. Now watch close. This is not time lapse video, it's real time. I don't know exactly how it works, but it does, and I have to say it's pretty cool. After letting it sit for a couple of hours, I can add the color that gets it back to its roots, Ford Blue. During the break, we went ahead and got this thing off the table for good. And wrapping up the bottom end is just a few short steps away. Then we can get it on the dyno cart, or in your case, probably go ahead and drop it into the engine bay. To supply oil to the engine, a Melling high volume oil pump we ordered from Summit Racing. To keep it in place, ARP bolts. The pump's pickup can bolt up now. Here's an easy way to get an extra set of hands. Felpro offers these oil pan installation studs that guide the gasket and pan to the block and even hold it in place so you can start the faster. They also keep you safe since you don't have to look under the engine to align it. The rest of the parts we put on in the dyno room. The Offenhauser dual port aluminum intake has separate runner systems for the primaries and secondaries. This design will add power across the entire RPM range. The 390 CFM Holly four barrel is designed for small V8s and six cylinder engines. It has vacuum secondaries and an electric choke. A two and a half inch collector is connected to inch and a half primary tubes. Now it came from Hedman and it's in a letter 300 breathe. For ignition, a DUI HEI distributor from Summit Racing. It's a one wire hookup and has a vacuum advance. Xcel 9000 wires will make the connection to the spark plugs. Behind that aluminum pulley is a Rock Auto stock replacement water pump. With the engine primed with comp braking oil bow, bow, bow. and 93 octane in the tank, we're set. You got ignition. Ready? Yes, sir. John will set the timing to 24 total degrees. Flat tap at cams require a break in at higher RPMs. Don't worry about all that smoke. It's just header paint burn off. Definitely sounds different. It's very unique. Our 300 is at operating temperature and runs awesome. Now it's time to replace the thinned out braking oil with their 10W30 muscle car street rod formula. I'm ready if you I'm are. I'm proud of you, you're not nervous today. Oh, I'm nervous today. Because it's only six and not eight. No. Now we didn't build a race engine. We simply brought a stock one back to life, a little stronger than before. <laughs> Things just wicked sound. 297, Man. 200. That's pretty really accurate. consistent. That's smooth as glass, man. The engine is a little lean in the upper RPM range. Now this carb doesn't have secondary jets, so here's how we'll correct it. Using a 59 thousandths bit, drill the main metering plate holes. This will allow more fuel in for a richer air fuel ratio. I heard the secondary's kicking a little harder that time, bringing it down. There we, there we go. go. Much more. 306, 203. 
which is all truck, all tow, all yeah. day. Now that the AFRs are where we want them, we know we'll find a little power with the timing change. 305, 206. This thing needs to go into 77 F-150 on like 35 inch super swampers and just cut donuts in a field. So that sit in your backyard? That's what I do with it. <laughs> That's exactly what I do with it. So there you go. You guys have been writing in, wanting us to do something a little different, and here it is. Two less cylinders, and we stood them straight up. So don't be afraid to ride in with your ideas. We'll try to get to them and build these things together. For you guys that like a shorter engine with a couple extra cylinders, I'm gonna show you how to install a Canton crank wiper on a small block Ford 302. It's a cheap way to free up some extra ponies, and here's why. At highway speeds, your crankshaft's rotation is causing a horizontal vortex of swirling air inside the crankcase. Now, as the oil drains back down from the top of the engine headed to the sump, it gets caught in that vortex as well. Now, it's kind of like swinging your arm through a swimming pool. It creates a lot of drag. Same thing down here, but you lose horsepower. Tests have shown anywhere from one to three quarts of oil can get caught in that vortex. And that leads to another issue, oil starvation down here in the sump at higher RPMs. The wiper sits between the pan rail and the oil pan itself. Now its job is to wipe oil from around the big end of the rod and the counterweight. It'll also disrupt the vortex of oil and get it down into the pan faster. It needs to sit as close to the rotating parts as possible, but still have a small air gap for part expansion when up to temperature. This one fits pretty good out of the package, but it's not as close to the counterweights as I like to see it. By slotting these holes a little bit, we can move the entire wiper inward and close the gap. Now a steel burr works great for this. Just let it do the work. Now don't be a hero either. Use a vise or risk the burr catching the part and injuring your hand. Now we have a tighter gap, but still enough clearance for when everything heats up and expands. A little silicone between the pan rail and the wiper will seal it up the right way. The power gains from this mod will vary from two to three on mild performance engines to seven to 10 on high RPM race engines. Plus you get better oil control, less rotating mass, and it reduces oil foaming on the surface. Not a bad upgrade for 25 bucks. Whether you have a carbureted or fuel injected engine, optimizing the air fuel ratio will lead to better performance and fuel economy. Now fast digital dual sensor air fuel meter will help get you there. This thing allows you to read the sensors individually or average them together for a more accurate reading. This thing has a built-in data logger that plays back on the display screen, so no laptop is needed. Now it has outputs for digital gauges and external data loggers underneath the heat shrink. This thing's available for gasoline, diesel, and methanol engines with prices starting under 470 bucks. Are you in the middle of or planning an LS1 or LS6 engine swap into your 70 to 81 Camaro? Well, good, because Patriot Exhaust has got the header you need, and they call it the Clipster. Now, it's not a full-length header, but it does have fairly long inch and 5 8 primaries. And those 3-inch collectors that dump at the rear of the engine bay give you excellent ground, steering, and suspension clearance. Now, they come with the silver ceramic coating, reducers, and the hardware you need to install it for under 420 bucks. Now, that's all the time we got for today. We'll see you next time.